Good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, on behalf of H. Carton Rogers, Vice Provost and Director of Libraries. Uh, my name is Will Knoll, and I'm the Director of the Kislak Center and the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies. Um, we're here tonight for the second annual Schoenberg Institute and the Herbert D. Katz Center Distinguished Fellows Lecture in Jewish Manuscript Studies. Uh, this lectureship and the fellowship that made it possible are the result of an, initi an initiative instigated by Natalie Dorman, Associate Director of the Katz Center, Lynn Ransom, Curator of Programs for the Schoenberg Institute, and Arthur Kieron, Schottenstein Jesselson Curator of Judaica at Penn. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over the podium to Steve Weitzman, Director of the Katz Center. Um, so this is actually a tripart introduction because in a moment I'll, I'll be handing things over to my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Talia Fishman, who will be introducing our speaker um, himself. But I wanted, if, with your patience, to just take a word or two to um, explain and express my appreciation for the collaboration that have made this event possible. And I want to emphasize that this event is part of a much larger initiative, and I just want to say a few words about that larger initiative. So as Will was saying, um, today's proceedings are the result of a collaboration between the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, uh, uh, the Katz Center, the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies, the Penn Libraries, and Arthur Kieran in his role as the curator of our Judaica collection and the Jewish Studies program. So all these units have come together um, to create a program whose purpose is basically a matchmaking program, a book matchmaking program that is meant to bring together a manuscript in the, an unpublished manuscript and an unstudied manuscript in the Schoenberg collection together with a scholar uh, in a position to illumine the contents of that manuscript. Um, I would also note that this has given the Cat Center a way to fill a position that was established in honor of my predecessor, David Ruderman, who is a longtime director of the Cat Center. Um, upon his stepping down from that particular role, um, the David Ruderman Visiting Scholar Program was established that was meant to bring um, a leading scholar to campus every single year. And for the last few years, we've been dedicating that position to this collaboration. So this event is functioning on a number of different levels. I want to um, also note that this program is, as I said before, it's part of a larger initiative. So this collaboration that's developed um, between the Schoenberg Institute, the Katz Center, and Jewish Studies actually has spun off in a number of diff different directions. So one of the things that um, the different partners have done together is create a, a MOOC, a massive online course that involves the scholar who's studying the manuscript where they use that manuscript as a launching pad for a, an online course that is free, um, available to the public, um, offered through edX. You can view these things on your own time um, and uses the manuscript as an opportunity to create a learning experience for a much broader community. Um, our speaker today, Alessandro uh, Guetta, he will be doing this MOOC and it will be available in a couple of months, I think. And we already have one online from a previous uh, participant in this series, uh, Professor uh, Svi Langerman of bar Ilan University. And you can go online to the edX site and take a course that um, focuses on a particular manuscript as a way to learn about the history of medicine in the Middle Ages. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, another spin-off from this partnership is a virtual seminar that has involved graduate students in Jewish studies from around the world. Um, and I sat in on one that you did a, a year or so ago, or I think now, June. in June. Um, and I think there were like, I don't know, 15 young scholars online. And uh, it was incredible to be having this learning experience with people in Europe and North America and Israel and elsewhere. Um, and a third component of this initiative is this public program, which is a chance for us to share the fruits of the scholarship made possible through this collaboration with the Penn community. So I want to um, express my thanks to all the participating units. Um, Talia, in her role as the former director of the Jewish Studies program, helped launch the partnership with Jewish Studies. Uh, Lynn Ransom and Natalie Dorman, who really, and Arthur, have been the key partners here and actually bringing this into reality. So I want to express my heartfelt uh, appreciation to all of them. And with that, I'll hand things over to Thank you. Well, it's really a delight for me to be here representing Penn's program in Jewish studies on behalf of its director, 
Professor Catherine Hellerstein, who sends her regrets. But it's really, I, I'm so lucky that I get to do this because I've been a great fan of Professor Guetta and his work for many years, and I will tell you very briefly about him. Alessandro Guetta is a professor of Hebrew civilization at INALCO, the Institut National des Langues et Civilisations Orientales in Paris, where he teaches courses in Jewish philosophy and Hebrew literature of the medieval and early modern periods. He has been the recipient of many academic awards, serves on the editorial committees of several journals and book series, and has published monographs in Italian, Spanish, and English that, on, the thought of, on topics that range from the thought of Machiavelli, philosophy and Kabbalah in the writings of Eliyahu ben Amozeg, Italian Hebrew poetry of the Middle Ages, and Italian Jewry of the early modern era. I might also note that Alessandro is a much sought after translator from Hebrew into Italian and French. It is he who is responsible for translating works by Israeli authors Aleph Bet Yehoshua, David Grossman, Amos Oz, Yehudit Katsir, Yoel Hoffman, and Yehoshua Kenaz. Professor Guetta's presentation today is called No Longer Alien, Alien Residents. Italian Jewish texts in the late Renaissance. Please join me in welcoming Professor Guetta. Thank you, thank you. It's an honor, a, a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Lynn, uh, Arthur, Natalie, and Stephen, and Talia, and thank you for inviting me. Now, when we deal with the subject of the so-called Judeo-Italian, meaning the language written and spoken by the Italian Jews over at least 600 years from the 13th to the 19th century, we encounter a considerable number of books, articles, chapters in books, handbooks, and encyclopedias. A recent survey by Aaron D. Rubin in the Handbook of Jewish Language of 2016 is the most recent synthesis of the subject. Most, if not all, these books and articles are learned studies focused upon the linguistic aspect of the question. Umberto Cassuto, the well-known historian and Bible scholar who lived and taught in Florence, Rome, and Jerusalem, pioneered the linguistic study of Judeo-Italian in the 1930s, with some remarkable studies on the translations of the Siddur and of the Bible. Many scholars followed after him, among whom we should mention at least Baruch Sermoneta, who is probably better known as a historian of medieval Jewish philosophy, as well as Maria Modena Mayer, <coughs> Luisa Cuomo, and Michael Rizik, all of whom approach Judeo-Italian from the perspective of linguistics, sometimes with very technical analysis. Cecil Roth, an admirer of Italian Renaissance and of the Jewish culture of that period in particular, contributed by publishing some interesting texts from the 1920s to the 1950s and adding a few comments regarding the positive integration of the Italian Jews in the surrounding society. Alan Friedman, in a book dated 1971, studied the question of the Hebrew script used by the Jewish Italian texts. The important contributions of these authors give us a detailed description of the history of the so-called Judeo-Italian idiom from the Middle Ages to the early modern period, including its morphological, phonetic and syntactic features, especially in comparison to the language or languages of non-Jewish Italians. The attention paid to the language is understandable, especially for the period before the first half of the 16th century, when the way of translating Hebrew texts was actually specific to the Jews in a language that Cassuto called a sort of Italian Yiddish. If the historians of the language generally concentrate their analysis on a period that precedes the so-called 
early modern era, they hesitate for the texts written from around 1550 onward, noting an evolution toward a more literary, standardized Italian. My research is precisely on those latter texts and has not a linguistic perspective. What is possibly missing, or at least what I felt and still feel as missing, is a study of the extant literary corpus before and especially after 1550 from the point of view of intellectual, religious, and literary history. Let's try to put it in a clearer way. Whereas a, a huge amount of linguistic work has already been done, some questions have not really been asked. Questions like, what was the status of Italian or Judeo-Italian vis-a-vis Hebrew? A large portion of the corpus are translations from Hebrew. Were they intended as simple tools for the comprehension of a Hebrew text and therefore destined to a readership and an audience not completely proficient in Hebrew? Or did they have, or at least aspire to have, a literary, intellectual, religious dignity of their own? Another set of questions concern the translation choices of key terms of Jewish religious culture, such as Elohim, Torah, Mitzvot, Chacham, adjectives like Hasid, Rahman, and theological terms like Leolam, Hashgacha, and so on. What do they tell us about the conceptual and spiritual world of the Italian Jews of the past? Actually, some of these questions have been addressed in a general and, we can add, preliminary way by some of the outstanding scholars in the Jewish studies of the 19th century, such as Maurice Steinschneider and David Kaufman. Maybe because they were the pioneers of these studies, the scholars of the 19th century often dared to formulate general judgments, including value judgments, where their successes were, and still are, much more cautious. Steinschneider, for example, drew a list and description of texts, printed as well as manuscript, where he highlighted a concentration of Jewish-Italian production in the so-called early modern period. In his essays on the Italian literature of the Jews, Italian, not Judeo-Italian, even if sometimes it is with medieval texts, the German scholar wrote that Italian Jews lived a linguistic amphibious life, as he called it, with a formula maybe not very elegant, but certainly effective, by which he meant that these Jews were not only at ease in these two languages, Hebrew and Italian, but also that they were inclined to express their intellectual spiritual and sentimental word in written form in both. With respect to this judgment, I certainly follow in Steinschneider footsteps. My interest for the Italian translation of Hebrew literature of the late Renaissance period probably started with the complete translation of the Morene Bochim, the guide for the perplexed, written in the late 16th century that is extant in manuscript form. You can see it. Uh, the title is Erudizione dei Confusi, composed by Yedidia Recanati of San Marino in 1581. It, it is extant in two copies. One uh, is uh, with correction and, and one is complete. Probably written, the second one written by his brother who was a scribe. And uh, you see there, Capo Primo, first chapter, and you can, maybe it's the, 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 the image is not very clear, the, the, the beginning of uh, Morene Buchim, of the Guide of, for the Perplexed, Gia, di già si sono dati a credere molte persone che Zelem in lingua ebrea significa la somiglianza e la forma di quello. Those who know uh, Morene Buchim know that the first chapter is about the uh, interpretation of the word Salem, the image, man was creating the image of God. So we have a complete manuscript version in Italian, good Italian, Hebrew script of the Morene Bochim, still unpublished. It was not easy at the beginning to decipher the Italian text, these texts written in Hebrew characters, 
an exercise that was then unusual for me. I'm coming from philosophy, philosophy. so to, to, to have to do with these strange letters was, was quite strange for me. But I still remember the pleasure of seeing a language emerge from another, so to say. A pleasure that still accompanies me in this kind of reading. When these texts, and particularly these translations or adaptations, are written in Latin or Italian script, a phenomenon which became progressively common from the end of the 16th century onward, parallel way of this, uh, this phenomenon, their most interesting side is no longer in the contrast between the Hebrew graphemes and the Italian meaning, but, I think, in the juxtaposition between two languages speaking of the same thing and drawing from different cultural coordinates. It's a secret of translation. Dozens of translations are extant in the period that I defined for my research, mid-16th to mid-17th century. Many of them are unpublished, not studied, unknown. So far, I kept a more ancient corpus of texts, the Mahzurim, the prayer books, translated at the end of the 15th century and in the first decades of the 16th, out of my research. You can see an example of... Uh, one of these, uh, we, we have a few of them, the copies, and there are also three printed editions of different periods, very interesting. You know, I'm not uh, going to the explanation of this particular way of translating, but maybe you, you, you will find the, the name of God in the second line after Baruch, which is Domedet, the second line, you know, the translation of the blessing, Domedet, which was a, a specific Italian way to translate the name of God, yeah, the tetragram, Domedet, which is, nobody knows what, what, what it is from, maybe Dominus Deus, which is not really Dominus Deus, where we, it, has, it has a T, not to pronounce the, the name of God, even in the Latin form, but we don't, we don't know. This is before my period, before the early modern period. After, after 1550, more or less, they don't translate any longer uh, 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 the tetragram by Domedet, this strange form, but they translate it very simply by God, Dio. Okay, so they, they are changing. So, so far I kept a more ancient corpus of texts that Mahzorim translated at the end of 15th century and the first decades of the 16th, out of my research, considering them as the expression of a popular language, destined for women in particular, implying mirror translations, or traduction calque, whose only ambition was to stick to Hebrew text and to make it comprehensible. Actually, in the introduction of some of these translations, the author, the translator, they have names, and they have a name, they said they, they write it for women, the destined for women. I must say that it was encouraged in this judgment of a lower language by the implicit or explicit assessments of the specialists started from Casuto. But was it so? Finally, looking at this relatively important corpus, I started to think that maybe these texts, pre modern, are not only the expression of an archaic and particular layer of Italian devoid of any aesthetic interest. What if these prayers were not only written in an, in, an, in an inelegant jargon, but were on the contrary an interesting, sometimes even beautiful example of religious texts, even poetic. These translations are literal, but nonetheless readable. They are different from the old biblical translations aimed at teaching the meaning of every Hebrew word and thus resulting in an odd text, Italian, with a Hebrew morphosyntax. Prayers were translated to be read and understood as such. You have the, the, the handout, the first example. Uh, it's, it's one of the blessings of the Amidah. Hashiva shoftenu kebarishona beyotzenu kebatchila. And, 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 and so on. We saw our judges as in former times. And you see the Italian translation, probably end of the 15th century, they put in bold 
the, 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 the words we, we, which are a calc of the Hebrew, li giudici nostri, where the possessive is after the noun, eh? uh, shoftenu, giudici nostri. Italian allows that, to put the possessive after, after the noun, but it sounds even more poetic. This is like in the old uh, style, Italian style. And then you see in italics, it's, it is added to the text to, 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 to make it more comprehensible. Fa ritornare gli giudici nostri come da prima e li consiglieri nostri come erano, which is not in the text, I know. And then the last line, Benedetto tu domedet, again and still the strange, really strange domedet, che ama giustizia e uh, ragione. The relative che, which is not in the text. In the Bible you wouldn't, you wouldn't find this addition. There are texts to be studied, not only from a linguistic point of view, but as a as literary text, I think. This is my suggestion. And I think that to formulate an objective judgment, we should bear in mind the general linguistic shift that took place in Italy in the middle of the 16th century, which obviously did not concern only the small Jewish minority. Old books by Christian authors were submitted then to a radical linguistic editing before they were reprinted. Experimented authors, I speak of Christian authors, needed sometimes a linguistic help to Tuscanize their texts. And still at the end of the 16th, 16th century, the necessity of teaching one's child to speak and write in this literary language had to be repeatedly reaffirmed. So if these Italian Jewish prayers were written before the national linguistic change, they necessarily did not match what can be called standard Italian in the same way many Christian texts did not. As I said, they just started to look into these prayer books. A further analysis will confirm or invalidate this idea that these texts were not merely instrumental but had a literary dignity of their own. Meanwhile, we can already elaborate on the fact that many Jewish women prayed in Italian, standardized or not, thus sharing with the Christians the same national linguistic koine, I assume. Praying is an activity often performed aloud, sometimes included singing, including singing. Almost certainly, these Jewish women did not only read their prayers in Italian silently. Italian was probably heard, not only written and silently read, and this conferred with the status of a living expression. According to the linguist Michael Rizik, and I quote, although the translations were intended for women, it seems that they were also meant to be used during synagogue services. If the official, collective, as well as individual prayer was obviously recited in Hebrew, there was a niche for Italian prayers too. This observation does not concern only the female recitation, but also the important corpus of paraliturgical texts, like Zemirot and Slichot, hymns and poems, considered optional, added to the core prayers. It is important to remember that the Siddur, the prayer book, or the Mahazor in translation, was no longer author in translation, was no longer authorized by the Catholic authorities after 1596. Only Hebrew texts were permitted, just as Christians could no longer pray in Italian, but only in Latin. That is the reason why we have, I think, we have very few copies of them printed or in manuscript form. I wonder what the destiny of the Italian translations of the prayer book would have been without that prohibition. Maybe it would have developed alongside the official Hebrew formulas. But let's go back to the period I am presently studying, the late 16th and early 17th century, the literary period. The first important category of texts written in those years is, not surprisingly, biblical translations, a traditional activity for Jews in all times and all regions. 
In this period, the style of translating seems to, ch to change, shifting from mirror or calc version, that essentially aimed, as I said, at teaching the original text and their, which is behind, and therefore stuck to it word by word, producing very peculiar results, shifting to more literary versions, still adhering to the Hebraica ver veritas, but syntactically correct and stylistically elegant in a pure and clean language. Tzach venaki, they write in Hebrew when they introduce these translations. But Christian authors use the same adjective in the same period, a pure and authentic Italian language. We have entire versions of one or several biblical books printed or the majority in manuscript, in Latin or Hebrew script, and a series of biblical glossaries, also either printed or manuscript, in Hebrew and Latin script, that follow the text translating every biblical word with one or more Italian words, generally the less common, by Yomer, by Daber, and God said, and, 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 Moe, and Moshe said, they are obviously not translated, for example. Actually, Thanks to this particular technique, the reader had at his disposal an almost complete version of the Bible. So it's a glossary, line to line, the main words to the words corresponded several words. We had an almost complete pasuk, verse. I suppose that this way of translating, which results in a kind of disguised version, was due to the prohibition, one more prohibition, to write, read, or even possess a biblical version in vernacular languages, decided by the Holy Office of the Inquisition and by the Congregation of the Index in a series of decrees from, 19, from 1559 on, and strictly and efficiently enforced. Only the Vulgate, Vulgate the, the, the Latin translation, was permitted in Catholic, Catholic lands until the 18th century at least. This situation was certainly the background of the well-known biblical dictionary Galut Yehuda, Galut Yehuda, printed, published first by two editions, by the Venetian rabbi Leone Modena, well-known rabbi, in 1612. In an allusive way, I'm sure everyone is trying to, <laughs> to read the text, in an allusive way that is nonetheless comprehensible in the introduction, Modena wrote in the introduction, in this kind of books they, have, they always have at least two introductions, one in Italian and one in Hebrew. That is different yeah? Yeah, for different uh, uh, readership. Sometimes also a third introduction in Latin. Now, uh, Modena wrote in the introduction that he had prepared a complete Italian version but that the period was not favorable to such an endeavor. And I think that this is a shame, for we could have had a sort of Jewish-Italian authorized version, Jewish version, and Modena could have perhaps been the Sadia of his Italian co-religionists. The comparison with Sadia Gaon, the immense scholar who lived in the 9th and 10th uh, century, is strengthened by the circumstance that the Egyptian Gaon, like the Venetian rabbi, was not satisfied with the existing translations of the Bible into his vernacular language. And you know, you, you can note already in the first, the first line that, okay, it's a beautiful Italian, it's a, a, a Tuscanized Italian, but it still it remains Jews, and uh, the, you can see that uh, Modena hesitates for the, 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 the translation of the first verse. He brings two different translations, one of it, it like Rashi at the beginning, he, 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 he brings several translations. He says, uh, at the beginning he created, or at the beginning of the, the creative process. Now, as for the other glossaries that follow the same technique, we must mention the most precise, wide, and ambitious among them. This one. Sefer Turgeman, almost unknown, but available 
uh, by, by the, the valuable and prolific Yedidiare Kanati, already mentioned him, who was born in the tiny republic of San Marino, you know where San Marino is, is a state, and used to be a state already in that time, and belonged to the even tinier Jewish community there. The Cuban Jewish community was basically his family, before moving to Pesaro. Recanati, Yedidia Recanati, an important person, is also, as I said, the author of Erudizione dei Confusi, the translation of Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed that I mentioned before, and also, among other works, of a Hebrew translation, the other way, probably from Italian, of the book of Judith. This latter work, explicitly prompted by intention to bring back a Jewish book to the bosom of its nation, shows eloquently, I think, that this was not a period of assimilation, meaning of loss of Jewish references. Unfortunately, Sefer Turgeman, you see the technique. For one word, there are many, many words. It actually, it's it almost a, a complete version. Uh, I studied it very in a de detailed way, and I, I come to, came to the conclusion that, unfortunately, Sefer Turgeman, big books, we have several copies of it, beautiful text in Hebrew letters, copied several times, mainly in the North Adriatic Italian regions, was, or at least I think was, a systematic plagiarism of the first Christian Italian version of the Bible. This one, printed, a bestseller, made from Hebrew and not from Latin, yeah, the first Italian version made from Hebrew and not from Latin, by the Florentine, Florentine Antonio Bruccioli in 1532. You see here another version, and reprinted many times. It was a big uh, uh, printing enterprise in Venice. Thus, Bruccioli's version, that was at the time when when uh, uh, Recanati wrote, uh, uh, wrote his text, he, he, we are uh, 50, 60 years after, Bruccioli's version, at the time of Recanati, was doubly banned, forbidden, as a vernacular translation, as I said, and because its author, Bruccioli, was convicted for his Protestant orientation. And so we had a doubly banned uh, version circulated among the Jews. Very strange. But this Italian text had been deeply influenced, in turn, by the Jewish translation, translation method. It's a long story. Both Recanati, the author of Sefer Turgeman, and Modena, the author of Galut Yehuda, and here you can see the, the introduction of the Galut Yehuda in a beautiful Italian, very eloquent, very interesting. Both declared that they wanted to provide the Italian Jewish teachers and students with a ready-made text that would have been able to replace the individual versions of every teacher who relied on their personal transmission from another teacher sort of standardized version. They openly expressed their wish to make a national version based on a national tongue, literary Italian, based on Tuscan, that, although relatively young, had proved its capacity to render every linguistic register. And I, I quote Modena himself. Modena invited his coreligionists to be no longer alien residents, in Italian, peregrini abitanti, which is reminiscent of the biblical ger toshav, no longer alien residents of the Italian tongue. He also clearly wrote about the modernity of his proposal. He, he writes the word modern. He was preceded by another translator of a Yiddish book, <coughs> then uh, a few decades be before him, he wrote, I want to transport, to transfer, the, 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 the German, as he said, translation into a modern Italian language. So the, the notion of, uh, of uh, modernity. We can therefore try to draw a first provisional conclusion. The integration of Italian Jews into the broader society 
was made in the period of ghettos, let's not forget, in the period of ghettos and growing segregation through the participation in a common linguistic space, young and ideologically neutral. Whereas Latin could have been perceived as the Christian language par excellence, even if the cases of Italian Jewish authors in Latin were not rare at all, but this is another interesting area to explore. A second category after biblical translation include religious poems. As a matter of fact, from the end of the 16th century, the Italian authors, translators, adapters concentrated their activity on paraliturgical texts. The prohibition to pray in Italian was most probably a power deterrent for potential translators of the Sidur, of the prayer book. Zmirot le Shabbat, a hymn for Shabbat, a hymn of song for Shabbat, are an interesting example of religious poetry of which we have several <coughs> translations, poetic translations. I started to transcribe and to study them in the very last weeks. It's a, therefore a recent ongoing research, which I give here some very preliminary and partial results. You can see here some fragments of this, uh, this uh, translation. One is Ginsburg, the Melodic Shabbat. Maybe you can read in the time to Poi all'immagine, Poi all'immagine, tua formò l'uomo di terra, and so on and so forth. In Italian script. In poetry, of course. Eh? And here we have another translation, more difficult to read, which is in the British, Helen Bridges Library. Queste dolam banae le recapai, you know, the Hebrew. Hebrew text, and then the translation is endecasyllable, the one that was managed to uh, open, I don't know, but all these mirrors are translated into Italian and endecasyllable, and they return to two adapters, speciale, aiutitate il mondo, those who are, who know Italian poetry will recognize the typical Italian rhythm. So I analyzed uh, three codices with the Hebrew Zmirot followed by their Italian translations. The hymns are not always the same in the three codices. All the three manuscripts present classical Zmirot like Ki Eshmera Shabbat El Ishmerenu and Tzur Michelo Achalnu. And quite interesting, at least one Zmirat that is typical, I think, if not exclusive, of the Italian, of Roman Right, starting Ifat Eli Omar Pene Kol Yetzurah. We'll come again on this text. Two of them have a typical Zemira starting Zachor Yom Shamor Yom Shabbat Le Kadesho. All the translations are in rhyme. The prosody is different from Hebrew, of course, owing to the difference of languages. And, but we note a tendency in the translations to reproduce the classical Italian poetic patterns, especially the octave, l'ottava, a stanza of eight lines typical of narrative poetry, preferably in endecasyllables, verse of 11 syllables, or eight syllables. The number of syllables, unfortunately, I must say, is not always respected. That could depend, or maybe I, I, I don't read it correctly, that could depend on the talent of the translator, adapter, poet, but the lack, the lack of exactitude can point, possibly, more than to an inability, to a lesser need of metrical stringency if these texts were destined for a sung performance. I don't know. Let's nobody knows, uh, as far as <laughs> I asked the, the expert in Pew team, Italian Pew team, they, they, didn't, they didn't even understand the question in Italian, yes. Pew team in Italian, sang, what, what are you talking about? Let's take as an example the Pew, you have it in the, the handout number two, whose first words are Netzach Vaed Ahode Le Shimcha Ram Benisa that also appears, in the also appears in the Italian prayer book. I will read the, the Hebrew, it's only four lines, it's, they are very long. Eh? 
and then an example of the Italian translation, just to, to listen to it to different rhythm, the, the Hebrew one. Netzach va'ed ahode lishimcha ram benisa goelu matzi ufode veodecha shamayim kisa elecha nafshi esa azamer lecha beodi veatadonaim again baadi kvodi merim roshi. The Italian translator. Uh, in Hebrew script, of course, I had to transcribe. That's why you have question mark because I didn't understand the meaning or the, the word which is behind it. In sempiterno ringraziario deggio al tuo nome, Signor, grande e sublime, che sempre mi salvi e con il tuo pregio fai il ciel di bello onor coprime. Rimetterò l'alma mia al tuo gran seggio e ti salmerò nel mio sedime. Che sei mio Signor di poggio e clemenza del mio capo corona et eminenza. And if you, if you look at the translation, we have not the time to, to, to go in translation, you, you see that it's almost, almost the same thing. It's very respectful of, of the text. Here, the, the quite simple Hebrew verses are transformed into typical Italian poetry, an octavo and decasyllables, as I said, with, with this particular rhythm. Of course, the translation, what we should call an adaptation, does not perfectly match the Hebrew text, word by word. But none of the ideas expressed in the original are neglected. The Italian author amplifies the original and resorts to paraphrases. We should be indulgent vis-à-vis -vis the exactitude of the poetic meter, as I said. Let's remember that we deal with adaptations, not with original creations. Hence the difficulty of being faithful, precise and beautiful. The Jewish Italian writers certainly knew the reductions, the reduzioni in octaves of the Homeric poems and of the psalms made by the Christian writers of the time and gave, I think, their own contributions. We must remember that this was the golden period of volgarizzamenti or translations from Greek and Latin into Italian, Jews, participated in this phenomenon, translating from Hebrew. The Hebrew pew team are sometimes translated in a complete different way in the three manuscripts. So they are, some of them are completely independent from each other. Other times with partial variants. In some cases, we have both in the same text, similarity and difference. Let us examine a stanza of the above quoted pew to title is Ifat Eli Omar, I will say the splendor of my God, which is the handout number three. It is a description of the creation of the world until the original sin and the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Gan Eden. The Hebrew text itself seems to be unstable in that it shows important differences in these manuscripts and in the printed versions, the Hebrew text. I give now a short excerpt uh, of the three versions, the, and the, the first and the third are written in Hebrew character, the second in Latin character. There is a mistake. The first one is Hebrew, and the second one is la in Latin. In Hebrew, the Hebrew uh, says, Totse eretz amar kol chaya uveima, rachman otam shamar kulam berov chokma, gam esev adama kol etz vechol anaf, kol tzipor kol kanaf, Mine it go da grad. Let the earth sprout, he said, every beast and animal. The merciful kept them all with great wisdom. The herb of the land too, every tree and every branch, every bird, every animal, water will swarm with an abundance of fish. Now, only just the first lines of the Italian versions. The first one, British Library, Hebrew and non Latin character. Dice alla terra di fruire le fiere con giumenti d'ogni sorte per cui li volsi ancora custodire il frutto per lor vita e ferma scorte. Giumenti is a typical Jewish-Italian word, the translation for bees or chayot. I know it is for Italian biblical translation. Let's look at the other translation, which is interesting, with the, 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 the variants. British Library, 105-12, fece la terra fiorire gli animali d'ogni natura, con diligenza del nor nutrire lui ne ebbe pur gran cura. And the Ginsburg fece la terra fiorire altri erbe ogni verdura, gli animali lor nutrire di ogni sorte. E 
ogni natura and so on. Now you see the, the, the similarity and the difference of the, these two last versions. Now a few technical remarks, and sorry for that. The first version shows an octave of endecasyllables rhyming A, B, A, B, A, B, C, C, which is the classical Italian scheme, poetic scheme of the octave. And all the manuscript is uh, an attempt to, to translate the Zemirot in uh, uh, octave, typical octave on endecasyllables with this rhyming scheme. The other two give an octave with lines of eight syllables. Here, the Italian rhyme follows the, the Hebrew scheme, which is A, B, A, B, B, C, C, D. So it adheres to the to Hebrew, where D is constant in all stanzas, both, both in Hebrew, Av, the rhyme Av, of dispute, of this poem, and in Italian to Anto or Anti. The prosody, and not only the, 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 the rhyming scheme of the shorter octaves is closer to the Hebrew text than the one in endecasyllables, in that it has a fast, regular rhythm based on feet with two syllables each. Ta 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 And the Hebrew, ta 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 The endecasyllables is completely different. Ginsburg is not only much more regular, you have it on the end out, much more regular rhythm based on feet with two syllables each, uh, is not only, sorry, is not in much more precise in the number of syllables, but shows also a metric consciousness, a metric consciousness expressed in the graphic disposition of the lines that you can see in my reproducing it on your handout. If we look at this relatively long poem, 15 or 16 stanzas as a tale, and the translator adapter as a ballad singer, the metric stringency becomes less important, as I said before. Now, why can we explain this phenomenon of similarities and, or, and differences? Perhaps authorial corrections that revise and try to improve an existing translation? Or maybe these changes are due to an oral transmission that resulted in inevitable alterations. People knew that, uh, sang that, maybe, I don't know. Now we'll give a further example of these changes in another text much more ambitious than this simple Zmirot. But meanwhile, I would like to add some thoughts concerning the Hebrew text of the Piyut, of this Piyut. Look at this. I notice some Hebrew words written at the margin of the page that have the same rhyme of the lines of the corresponding stanza. You see at the end, in red, under underscore, Dvarav, and then at the margin you have Zahav. Very strange, very strange. Um, could that mean that the translator allowed himself to edit the Hebrew text? Those were years of poetic creativity in Italy, concerning, among others, Zmirot le Shabbat. Zmirot le Shabbat were composed by renowned authors such as Mordechai Dato, the famous polymath Azaria de Rossi, and its Hak Marli, also a famous rabbi. If this assumption is correct, we would have here the example of an editor translator working both with Hebraic and Italian linguistic material. A typology certainly possible in Italy, as the relatively numerous bilingual poems alternating Hebrew and Italian verses clearly attest. The translations or adaptations of these relatively simple Hebrew poems were relatively simple Italian poems, made to be performed, recited or sung, or for the sake and the pleasure of writing poetry. Difficult to know so far. Another genre that prompted many poetic adaptations are the slichot, or penitential poems, that are generally much more sophisticated. Some of these adaptations were composed 
and published in the 16th and the 17th centuries, and other, many others, are still in manuscript. The high number of Italian adaptations of Hebrew penitential poems is understandable if we look at the contemporary production in Italian. After 1550, the genre of rime spirituali, or spiritual rhymes, with Catholic devotional inspiration, literally exploded. Still incomplete bibliographies state hundreds, maybe thousands of publications, thousands of publications of Italian spiritual poems from 1550 to 1600. That period, love, love poetry was replaced by religious poetry. The sensual desire gave way to the repentant soul. And so I think we must read these Jewish-Italian poetic adaptations in the background of the enormous Catholic production, Catholic production of that period, following the Council of Trento and during the years of the so-called Counter-Reformation. There was an important production of new Hebrew devotional poems, too, in Hebrew, such as the ones collected in the well-known book Canfer en Anim by Yedidia Kalmi, published in 1626, and many others. But these Shirim, Shvachot, Uzmirot, uh, poems, uh, uh, praise, and hymns, were composed for a collective performance in the newly created religious brotherhoods and were not intended as a personal effusion of the writer. We have, on the other hand, a series of Italian adaptations of Hebrew medieval pew team, apparently all of them of penitential nature, in which the author, and therefore the reader or the singer, speaks in the first person. Among these Italian adaptations of Hebrew religious poetry, a particular place is occupied by a pute, a religious poem, that belongs to the Italian translation, whose title is Meon Hashoalim, Residence of the Besiegers, which is a section or a chapter of the important Mikdash Meat, you can see one of the, the numerous manuscripts, Little Sanctuary, Mikdash Meat, written in tercets of Terza Rima, you see the three verses, Terza Rima, it was the meter, of course, of Dante's Divine Comedy, by Moshe of Rieti, around 1420. So the pewter I'm talking about is taken, is an excerpt of this Mikdash Meat. And the success of Mikdash Meat, a poem of about five, thousand verses, that is at once an encyclopedia of general and Jewish knowledge, a history of Jewish literature, and the description of a celestial journey was immense among the Italian Jews. Fifty-three manuscript copies of it are extant, partial or complete, and you see how carefully it is written and a thorough, a very detailed commentary on it was composed around 1590, which is our period. The so far anonymous commentator calls Rieti, the author, in admiration, a Hebrew Dante. Mikdash Meat, this poem, still waits for a critical edition and a thorough study. The commentary is not only unpublished, but even ignored by all bibliographies. Now, this section, Meona Shualim, which is a prayer of 115 tercets in the form of Vidui and Slicha, that recalls Ibn Gabirol's Keter Malchut, Crown of Kingdom, was copied separately many times as an independent poetic composition. In a letter, the famous philosopher and exegete Ovadias Forno, 15th century, asked a friend to send him the text to be consoled by its pleasant aspect. The polymath Azere de Rossi executed a copy of it. As a probable evidence of its success, Meona Shualim was also adapted into Italian 
in rhyme tercets at least by five different authors. Sometimes it comes in the same manuscript codex or, or in a printed book with the adaptation of other important medieval poems like by Abachia ibn Pakuda and Shlomo ibn Gabirol. Three of these adaptations were published and their authors are known. They are Lazzaro da Viterbo, and you can see it, the 1580s, more or less, the date is not precise. So the author of this is uh, uh, Lazar da Viterbo, or Eliezer Matzliach uh, uh, Hakohen, a prestigious rabbi and humanist. He was an important rabbi, but uh, he wrote much more in Italian and in Latin than in Hebrew. A, a, a typical humanist. We have only a Shuvot responsa, ritual responsa by him in uh, Hebrew, and some important texts in beautiful Latin and this beautiful translation in Italian. So a second translation is by Shmuel da Castelnovo, you see on the left, which this time is in uh, Hebrew script, which is also a rabbi. And on the left, uh, uh, we have an, a woman, Deborah Scarelli, rare, even among Christians, to, to, to find a, a real Hebrew poetess, especially for this kind of poems, even the, the, the poet who, who inaugurated this, this genre of poems was a woman, Vittoria Colonna. So this is the translation. They are completely different, the translations, completely different. All three uh, were from Rome and lived between the second half of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century. Another version, also complete and beautiful and also completely different, is still in manuscript form, is at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Now we can only get a hint of the richness and variety of these texts, 115 tercets, by comparing two stanzas. So I know to myself to, to read the Hebrew of two, two stanzas and then just the first lines of the, the possible he, uh, Italian version. The Italian, uh, the, the, the Hebrew version, which belongs, I, I, I recall, to the, uh, the beginning of the 15th century by Moshe of Rieti, the, the Hebrew text, uh, handout number five. Nafshi, it's an anaphor. The poet addresses his soul and, uh, oh, my soul, you must do this and that. You are guilty. You, you don't belong to this mortal body. You belong in other worlds, celestial, and so on. Don't, be, don't fall in the world of temptation. Nafshi, sam katsurim betsurim kinech umrutzatech gam kitzviah rodefet rike kore beharim. Nafshi, Imat mi marom kishvuya, uchtselover mispar ye mechel dech, maze tishtakei toch gviya. And the tentative English version, very difficult. Oh, my soul, you place in fortified rocks your nest, and you run to her as a gazelle, pursuing emptiness as one who cries in the mountains. Oh, my soul, if you are a prisoner from above, and if the counted days of your world are like a passing shadow, what is your settling in a course? Now, let's look at the, at the translation. The first one from Lazzaro da Viterbo. Let's, let's hear the rhythm. Alma, se posta in nido in alto scoglio, qual capria corre in van, segue le peste, qual chi tramonti chiama il suo cordoglio. Se preda sei dal luogo alto e celeste, e son come ombra i tuoi fugaci giorni, perché t'affondi in la corporea veste? Which is beautiful Italian poetry. Uh, written by a rabbi. Now let's look at the at this anonymous. Uh, I wish I, I would find out who was the author of the another beautiful translation of this still manuscript at Oxford. Porto stimi gli scogli e mi sgomento del tuo correr veloce ai propri danni, seguendo l'ombra e t'abbracciando il vento. Alma, se da celesti e terti scanni sol per transito sei qua giù mandata. Stanzia rui ognor angi e taffanni. 
Of course, an Italianist will find a sort of a, a lot of Petrarca quotation, not only of Dante, of Petrarchism is the style of, uh, of uh, the time. Now, a fifth, uh, we have so far four adaptations, no? the, the three printed and the one manuscript. Now we have a fifth adaptation, also still in manuscript form, which is, oh, I'm sorry, which is extant in no less than five or six, even six. Meanwhile, I, I, I should have had another, another version. Five or six versions that show, like our Zemirot, many variants. They are written in Hebrew or Latin script and are more or less adhering to a high lit, more or less, to a high literary level, both in the choice of words and in prosody. Now, let's examine the same stanza in two different transmissions of the text very quickly. Alma mia, I post, no, the first one, the, you, it's your handout, number six, and final quotation. Um, also in Oxford. Alma mia, I posto in gran riparo tuo nido, e quanto una perra sfrenata. The same text is in the version at the Jewish Theological Seminary. It changes the, 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 the final words, not perra sfrenata, dog, but capriola ratta. Perseguita vanità e parvolare. Prosody is not perfect. But let's look at another version, that one. So I was reading this one. Now let's look at this one. You already know that the difference in the app for the Italian screen and uh, careful it was written, very elegant. By the way, this manuscript we have also an unpublished and unknown version of the Keter Machot, completely unknown and ignorant, not, not complete translation. So uh, let's see what the, the, the anonymous translator does. I think that it's come after this one, does of this first version. Ponesti, and out six, second case. Ponesti alma mia in gran riparo, tuo nido e come capro t'hai dato, a vanità e come uccel volare. So you see the difference, uh, similarity and difference. So what explains uh, uh, such an abundance of the adaptations, all of which respect the interlocking rhymes of the model of the Hebrew poem, which explicitly borrows Dante's Italian model. Moshe of Rieti followed Dante in his Hebrew poem. And these translators follow Dante, <laughs> they go back to Dante writing in Italian verses. This poetic tour de force that in some cases produced considerable aesthetic results were certainly not prompted by the necessity of making a text comprehensible, like the biblical or liturgical translations. We can rather think of a sort of maybe poetic competition, an exercise to prove one's literary skills. Here the impression is that unlike the translations of the Bible, the, the adaptation or translations adaptation of these texts become autonomous from the original, like compositions in their own right, thus to be read and evaluated as such, without necessarily referring to the original, even if they are faithful to the original. In the introduction to his booklet, Lazzaro da Viterbo, you remember him, he's an important rabbi, dedicates his work to a woman, Donna Corcos, a member of the Jewish Roman elite, hoping to hear her singing it. He writes this in Italian. The award of my endeavor will be hearing you singing some lines of it, even if it is a penitential poem. That's, you know. he, he adds that he made this adaptation in Italian più per trastullo che per darla fuori, simply for pleasure, not to publish it, but he published it. <laughs> we must assume that translating or adapting from Hebrew into Italian corresponded to an aesthetic wish. We can go further and think of these literary enterprises as the expression of an intellectual, if not religious and spiritual, need. 
In other words, a particularly beautiful Hebrew text that was adapted into Italian brought with it a transformation of the original text into a, a new literary context. As a result, the authors and the readers and listeners too could possess a text according to the coordinates and the frames of reference of both, both their spiritual and intellectual words. What can we say of the fifth adaptation of Meona Shualim with its five or six versions? All of them different. We can suppose an oral transmission that would justify the numerous variants. Or we have here a version in progress, a succession of texts proceeding from a dialectic, dialectal Italian heavily connotated first the left, above on the left, dialectical Italian heavily connotated at the central Italy dialect to a more literary Tuscan model, on the right. If so, Jews, like Christians, would have modernized their texts. Hebrew was the beloved language of prayer, of the Bible, of many texts studied, of numerous other aspects of religious and national belonging. It was a second linguistic nature. As the Christian Hebraist Marco Marini wrote, Christian Hebraist Marco Marini wrote in his Hebrew grammar published in 1585, Jewish children learn Hebrew with their mother's milk. And we must recall that exactly in this same period, some Italian Jewish authors brought Hebrew to an extremely high degree of richness and complexity. Italian, on the other hand, in its dialectical form, was a commonly spoken and commonly spoken and heard language, the language of immediacy, but also in its literary form of a series of non-Jewish texts certainly highly appreciated by them, and it was not less beloved than Hebrew, as these adaptations seem to show. Many other adaptations from Hebrew into Italian were written in the early modern period with different literary ambitions. Most of them are still in manuscript form and are waiting to be discovered, deciphered, transcribed, and studied. Their number has decreased since the second half of the 17th century, when Hebrew was seen as the sole possible expression of Jewish religiosity in a context of growing fundamentalism. This is my reading. This situation continued well into the 18th century, with very few exceptions. For instance, an illustrious example, Moshe Chaim Lutzapto, the poet and Kabbalist and writer, who read and studied Italian books extensively, first half of the 18th century, did not write a single word in Italian, even in, he, in his private correspondence. But from around 1750 onward, you remember it's the end of the Vulgate uh, among Christians, we have a new series of translations. It starts again. Quite interesting, of many texts chosen 200 years before. The Psalms in different versions, Ibn Gabirol Keter Malchut, of course, Pirkei Avot, Maxim of the Fathers, the prayer book, but also, and also, still unpublished and manuscript, of Yedaya Bedersis Bechinat Olam. Some of them have an explicit aesthetic ambition. Except the Sidur and the Pirkei Avot, they are all, all still in manuscript form, and they are all, of course, in Latin letters. We are in the 18th century. To conclude, I have the feeling of lifting a corner of a veil uncovering, if not a continent, at least a large, almost ignored country, a substantial portion of the Italian Jewish culture of the late Renaissance, parallel to the Hebrew production, that cannot be confined, I think, to a place of marginal curiosity. Nor should these texts be treated in a patronizing way as the expression of a peripheral group that struggled to attain the literary standards 
of a highly cultivated society. These Jews did not master Italian. It's not true. These series of texts certainly deserve to be studied from a linguistic standpoint, but also as one of the collective voices of a whole community that did not see any discrepancy with its other voice. Thank you.